Please stand if able. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God, to comfort all who mourn. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, to display his glory. Brothers and sisters, too often we find ourselves lost in a world of sin, a sin of our own making and a sin of the system and communities in which we live. We live in such a broken world and we are a people in need of a Savior. But the good news is this, the Savior came to seek and save the lost and in Jesus Christ we are found. So let us turn to our Savior now in prayer through our corporate prayer of confession, followed by a moment of silent personal confession before God. Let us pray. God of life, we gather this morning knowing the pain of the world. Around us and among us, there are broken-hearted people, people imprisoned by oppression, people who are anxious, and people who mourn. As we prepare for holiday celebrations, we remain aware of those who grieve, who are sick, who feel lost. Often we seek to avoid this pain. Regularly we seek distractions to keep us from focusing on the needs around us. In the desert places which we walk, the streets we roam, the paths we cross, Guide our feet. Take us to places where you would go. Give us words that you would use, that in this Advent season of promise and preparation, we might point the way with John the Baptist to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world.
Amen. Scripture reminds us that God demonstrates His love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. To prepare our hearts for the hearing of God's word, let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Listen now to a reading from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build upon the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. The word of the Lord.
There are times, friends, that um, the choir preaches when they, they lead us in worship, and today was one of those times. We have been richly blessed. I'm reading this morning from the first chapter of John. We're going to read verses 6 through 8 and then jump down to verse 19 and following. Let us listen for God's word to us today. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. And then at verse 19. This is the testimony given to John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. I'd invite Elder Deb Baker and Amy and Cody Fagan and Sarah and Eric Swab to come forward and present their children for the sacrament of baptism. Hear now the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And hear also these words from Holy Scripture. The promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls. Friends, obeying the word of our Lord Jesus Christ and confident in his promises, we baptize those whom God has called, whether they like it or not. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, 
and join to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Friends, let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. On behalf of the session, I present Tippy Barton Swab, daughter of Eric and Sarah Swab, and Caleb Douglas Fagan, and Evan Matthew Fagan, sons of Amy and Cody Fagan, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Sarah and Eric, Amy and Cody, in presenting Tippy. Caleb, and Evan for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ and that you want your daughter and your sons to study him, know him, love him, and serve him as their, his chosen disciples. Do you desire that Tippy, Caleb, Caleb, and Evan be baptized? Do you? Yes. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your children? Do you? Our Lord, Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the saints of the church, promise to tell these new disciples the good news of the gospel, to pray for them and by your fellowship to strengthen their ties with the family of God so that they will someday profess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you? We do. And a few other questions. Through baptism, we enter a cov covenant established by God. And within this covenant, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. In embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. So trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, please respond with, I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, please respond with, I do. And finally, will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, please respond, I will, with God's help. Our God nourishes and sustains all living through things through the gift of water. In baptism, we are reminded of the story of the faith. In the beginning of time, God's spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. In the time of Noah, God destroyed evil by the waters of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. God liberated Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea into the freedom of the promised land. And Jesus was baptized by John in the waters of the Jordan and anointed with the Holy Spirit. And by the baptism of his own death and resurrection, Christ set us free from sin and death and opened the way to eternal life. We understand that, Tippy, Caleb, and Evan, there is no possible way for you to know all of this now. So we all promise to be teaching and reminding witnesses to you of this, our story. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us as we baptize with water, Baptize us with Holy Spirit. Remind us that we are all your children, that you love us, that you hold us, that you bless us. We thank you for the water of baptism, and we pray your touch upon it now through Jesus Christ. Amen. No, you're going to do it. All right, Tippy, you ready? See everybody? Tippy, you are a very special child of God, and God loves you very much. So I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Okay. Caleb Douglas Fagan, God has made you God's own, and I baptize you today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 
Evan Matthew Fagan. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. See what love the Father has given us that we can be called children of God. And so we are. Okay, you want to bring the other newest <laughs> members of God's family? These are the newest members of God's family. Let us welcome them. Let us rejoin in prayer. Almighty God, giver of life, you have called us by name and pledged to each of us your faithful love. We pray for your children, Tippy, Caleb, and Evan. Watch over them. Guide them as they grow in faith. Give them understanding and a quick concern for neighbors. Help them to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. We also pray for these parents. Help them to know you, to love you with your love, and to teach your truth, and to tell the story of Jesus to their children. We pray all of this in the name of the one who was baptized, your son, who is our Savior and risen Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And to remember this day, we have something for you. We have the service as well as a certificate and their first Bible. Since you have the free hands, I'm going to give you both of those. And thank you all. Do you want to sit down and then I'll give you the baby? Would the children come and join me? so happy that you are sitting next to me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so today um, we're going to talk about Mary. You see, see this figure? This is Mary. So who is Mary? Does anyone know who Mary is? The one who has the baby. Well, there's two ladies who, who had babies, and we just had that baptism. Neither one of them is named Mary. So, so ladies have babies, right? Yep. And one of the babies got in both of the adults didn't. Right, right. What baby did this lady have? Jesus. Jesus. Very, very good. So as we... Jesus is up there, and Jesus is also right here in your heart. Isn't that wonderful? So I'm going to put Mary in our nativity scene as we continue to build our nativity scene. And I believe we have a song. Do we have a song, Mrs. Nicewander? Can I sit with you? While we are waiting, come.
It's a steering wheel. Okay, um, I think uh, we need to turn right up here by the light. Oh, okay, dokie. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Julie. You got the map upside down. Here, with this right here. Well, that doesn't there make any sense. It makes perfect sense. North is up at the top. Ed, take a left up here. Oh, okie dokie. Oh, who rats gum in this? Look, let, let me be the navigator, okay? Why do you get to be the navigator? Because I know where I'm going. All right. <laughs> really? Look, it's just been a while. I quite remember all the details, but I'm sure I'll figure it out as we're going along. Ed? Take the next left. Okie dokie. Dad told us to follow the Texaco station. He said, look for the big star. You can't miss it. But look at this place. It's been ghost town after ghost town. He can't be serious about this. Look, trust Dad, okay? He gave us this map for a reason. We'll be fine. Now just keep heading straight, Dad. Oh, okie dokie. We'll be there in no time at all. Bruce... Splash some water in your face, will you? You look like a mess. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Would you guys pray with me, please? Gracious God. Gracious God. We thank you for showing us the way. We thank you for sending us witnesses to show us the way. We thank you for being with us as we worship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I begin the sermon, um, a number of folks have urgently passed me notes that I made an error in the announcements. That was not the first time that happened. That will not be the last time that happened. Um, and today, the error I made about, was about the time of the caroling. It seems that the caroling begins at Birchhaven at 1 o'clock. So if we met here at 1 o'clock, we would be late. So let's meet in the great room at 1230 not at one, and then we'll carpool over to Birch Haven. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, pour your Holy Spirit upon us this day, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In our passage from the Gospel this morning, the author takes great pains to make sure we know at least one thing. John is not the Messiah. John ain't it. He is not the one. John states that he is not the one, not the Messiah, not he who is coming or is to come eight times in just a few verses. He is not it. He is not the one. He is not the Messiah. And just so you were not confused, he is not the one who is to come. John isn't the Messiah, he is a witness. And while John is not the Messiah, being a witness is a very important thing. Witnessing is holy work, and witnessing is something we too can do. On the front of your bulletin, there's a painting and it was completed, this painting was completed in 1542 by the Italian artist whose name, who is known as Titian. This is one of many paintings that show John the Baptist pointing. If you are an internet user and you Google on Google Images um, John the Baptist pointing, you'll find many images that come up. Um, it's, it's very common to see John the Baptist pointing. John points towards something other than himself, towards someone other than himself. This is the stance of a witness. It isn't me he is saying. 
The painting also includes some other clues that even if we didn't know the identity of the figure in the painting, it would help us figure it out. There is a lamb at John's feet, which symbolizes Jesus, the Lamb of God. And John's staff is actually a cross, pointing with him to the cross that is to come for the Lamb. And finally, in the background of the painting, there is a river, the River Jordan, the site of John's most remembered ministry, the baptisms for which he is named. In John, the actual baptism of Jesus is not seen, it is only referenced. John speaks of it as if he were an eyewitness. He talks of his experience of seeing the Spirit descend like a dove upon Jesus, and the word he had received from God, that the one on whom the Spirit descends and stays is the one who will baptize with Holy Spirit. Because Jesus' actual baptism does not appear in John's gospel, the testimony of John the Baptist is important. His role as a witness is important. His ministry of witnessing is one way that the reader and the hearer of this gospel will come to know who Jesus is. Witnessing is important. Being a witness is important. Witnesses point to the truth. They point out the truth. They point toward realities that others might not see if it were not for the work of the witnesses. When we baptize children, witnesses are needed. The parents, and in some churches, the godparents or sponsors in the Presbyterian church, elders in the congregation, they all, we all, we act as witnesses. And children, those who are young, they need witnesses. They need people to remember and reflect and point toward the truth that these children who will not remember their own baptism, that in this sacrament, in this holy act, people stood and stated that they were created by a God who loves them and put in families who love them. And a congregation, a whole congregation, made promises to them to be invested in their care and their life and their formation in the faith. Children need people to witness to them about their baptism and to remember and tell the story as they grow. Truth needs witnesses to point out the way, to point out reality that others might not see otherwise. We are living through a season of social upheaval in our country where many, many people across the nation are taking up the holy work of being witnesses witnessing to a truth they feel called to share with others. They share this truth with others, some of whom agree, some of whom disagree, some of whom are confused, and others who are apathetic or even unaware. I talked to a woman this week who said, I never watch the news, I never read a newspaper, I never listen to the radio news because it's depressing. It's possible that that woman and others like her do not know that we are in a season of social upheaval where people are out on the streets of many cities protesting. So there are people who are unaware, but there are also people who agree and those who disagree. Those in the streets are pointing. They are pointing toward truth they feel called to share. They are out making a point that makes some people mad and other people sad and some just perplexed. A like situation met those who wrote the Confession of Belhar, a document the Presbyterian Church is considering now for possible adoption among our confessional statements. The, conf the Confession of Belhar emerged during the apartheid era in South Africa where racial separation was mandated by the state and supported very tragically by the church. 
Apartheid in South Africa was a time of racial violence and much, much bloodshed and torture, much of it state-sponsored, and death, primarily affecting black women, men, and children. The Confession of Belhar emerged after some infamous massacres of protesting school children by the state. The Confession points toward the truth that is Jesus. Jesus who calls the church to pursue unity and reconciliation and justice. And the Confession made many people mad. Can you believe that? That people would say, this is what I think is the truth and it would make people mad? Can you believe that that would happen? Many people in the church became mad at what the confession said. People, church leaders, stopped talking to each other when the confession was published. People, Christians, found difficult con difficulty continuing to be in relationship because of the painful truth to which the confession pointed. Those who wrote and proclaimed the truth of the Confession of Belhar were pointing to a truth that many found difficult to hear. This is the state of being for all witnesses. Witnesses, witnessing is a risky business. People are often happy when witnesses are not around or wish they would shut up. John the Baptist would go on to be executed by the state for his uncompromising commitment to the witness he felt called to make. The protesters on the streets of many cities and towns are making many people angry and facing some level of violence in response, some of it inflicted by people who work for the state. Those who wrote and proclaimed the truth of the Belhar Confession received death threats. Um, some folks who wrote the confession had to move from place to place because people were looking to kill them. They had to respond to people leaving the church and others who editorialized about how unchristian they were being, how they were raising conflict, making conflict in the church and decrying how unfair they were to people who only wanted to maintain order, which is, after all, what God desires for human society. Of course, those who called for order and peace in South Africa were willingly blind to the disorder that was enveloping their country, which was resulting in so much bloodshed, torture, violence, and death. To witness is to point the way, to point the way to truth. Truth that people often find difficult to hear and receive. Truth that people in power often find angering. Today, as we have witnessed a baptism of three children, our three newest members of God's family, we must, we must remember our role, our responsibility to remember and reflect and recall so that these children remember through our memories what happened here. We must point to the truth that God has put God's seal of love and forgiveness on them even at this very young age and that they are now God's own forever. We must remember that these children and other children and youth and young people and people outside the church are watching. People outside the church are watching the church all the time to see what it means to us, how we are living out, what our witness looks like about the truth of the gospel. They are watching and they are learning by watching our witness and where our lives point. You know, it's a very scary thing to think that people who are not Christian, who know I'm Christian, look at me in the grocery store or the doctor's office or as I drive down the interstate. And as they see me, they are thinking that must be what it means to be a Christian. It's a really scary thing. So when a, a youth group finals study hall happens, like happened here this last Friday night, and 16 adults come out to mentor and be with our youth, the youth are watching 
they are watching. And they are seeing people witness to the truth that these children, these young people, they are important and worthy of time and energy and effort and deserving of our observing the promises we made to them. When we have an opportunity to witness to our children, to our youth, when we can witness to the truth that our children are precious before God, we must take this opportunity. We must cherish and invest in the chance to point the way. Let our lives point to the truth that we know that Jesus is the Son of God, the one who is the light, who brings light to a world in darkness. And let we who live by this light witness to it in all we do and say that those who are watching in the church and most especially outside the church might learn through our witness and might see the truth to which our lives are pointing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. As you are able, will you stand with me as we affirm our faith using a part of the Confession of Belhar, as printed in your bulletin. We are going to do this responsively. God has reconciled us to God's own self and to one another and has made us one community of love. We celebrate God's gift of unity and claim it as our calling. Separation, enmity, and hatred are sins that Christ has already conquered. They have no place here among the beloved of God. God has given us many ways to enjoy our unity. We commit ourselves to bless one another. We will keep the one faith and fulfill our one calling. We will be of one soul and mind. We will share one baptism, eat one bread, and drink one cup. We will confess one name and share one hope. We will bear one another's burdens and build each other up. We will suffer together for the sake of God's righteousness. We will pray together and serve God together. We will fight together against everything that threatens our unity. We will use our differences to serve Christ, one another, and the world. We celebrate God's gift of unity and claim it as our calling.
please be seated. Now let us serve God with our tithes and offerings. with gifts so that we might do great things with them, loving God. Feed the hungry, house the homeless, lift up the fallen, speak hope to those in bondage to life, 
Bring these gifts, bless our, bless our lives as we seek to take the good news into our world. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, we thank you for pouring your power upon us and pray that you would continue to bless us with your spirit and your power, that with your insight, with your intelligence, your energy, your imagination, we might be blessed so we would be apt witnesses to your truth. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for all those who are experiencing loss and ha are grieving. We pray today for the family of Chandler Phillips, and we pray a prayer of thanksgiving for his life and witness and that he is now united with you. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those who are experiencing any illness or need, most especially Jean Treese, and Nancy Wilkins and their families and all those we name in our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for every good gift, Lord. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of this church and the opportunity to witness to your truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are going to sing verse 1 and 4 of the final hymn. remind children preschool through fifth grade to meet Mrs. Nicewan around the steps immediately following service and students and their parents participating in the 11 p.m. Christmas Eve service meet me in the library immediately following service. Peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you.
Now may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.